The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Hume, which, which also, is also shown at item 14 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. I call Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to express my deep disappointment in the failure of the Labor government to address the cost of living, which is impacting every single Australian right now. It's not just a matter of public importance. For many families, it is the only issue that matters. On the first Tuesday of May this year, after its meeting, for the first time in a year, the Reserve Bank Board did not increase interest rates. Now, the signal to the government could not have been clearer. The Reserve Bank Board gave the Labor government an opportunity to lead the way to help Australians that are doing it tough in Labor's cost of living crisis. It gave the government an opportunity to show leadership by reducing expenditure in the budget, by doing its bit to slow aggregate demand, to do a bit of the, the heavy lifting with the anti-inflationary tools that are at the government's disposal so that the RBA wasn't forced to, do, to use the only tool that it has and continue to ratchet up interest rates to bring inflation down. But unfortunately, the Labor government did not take up this opportunity and instead it delivered a budget with $185 billion in new spending with absolutely no plan to fight inflation. And not only that, but at a time when inflation has been above 7 per cent for three quarters in a row, the government removed from its fiscal strategy its previous priority to get inflation under control. There it was in black and white in October 2022, but it was gone by May 2023. In October 22, the Treasurer said that inflation was public enemy number one. They said it was the dragon that needed to be slayed. But by May 23, well, the government had raised the white flag. So the RBA has no choice. The government forced its hand and last Tuesday, once again, it increased interest rates once again to try and get inflation under control. And the country groaned under the weight of increased financial pressure. Families cried out at the unfairness of the endless costs of living. Rising energy prices, rising rents, rising grocery prices at the checkout and now rising mortgages again. In fact, an additional $22,000 for a family that has a mortgage of $750,000. Where, where's the average family supposed to come up with that sort of money? But what choice was there? The RBA governor made it clear time and time again that getting inflation under control is the only priority, is the number one priority. It is absolutely critical. Lowering inflation is the only policy that will deliver cost of living relief to all Australians. And this isn't a political assessment. Independent experts are unanimous. It doesn't matter whether it's Chris Richardson or Beta Shares economist David Bassisi or Bill Evans from Westpac. And let's face it, the Treasurer was quick to quote Bill Evans on, on budget night, but he said that the first to cut rates may be the first cut to rates may be delayed given the spending in this budget. He said that excluding COVID response, the spending package in the budget was about twice as large as in previous budgets, twice as large. But it's not just their spending, there are additional taxes there too, a truckies tax, a farmers tax, and that will all be passed on to consumers, increasing their cost of living. Now, in the weeks since the budget, we've seen markets, we've seen economists, and now, of course, the RBA itself react to the budget by increasing their forecasts of inflation and interest rates. In fact, the budget itself forecast interest rates of 3.85 per cent ongoing. Well, how quickly, how quickly that forecast disappeared. They all warned that there is more pain to come, more pain to come caused by this Labor government. Labor has been a government for more than a year now. It's delivered two budgets, and it's been clear in both that Labor has no plan to tackle inflation. They are content to let the RBA governor do all the heavy lifting and then blame him afterwards, complain about him. Jim Chalmers called on the RBA governor to explain himself. Well, what audacious hypocrisy. Make no mistake, this is Labor's rate rise. This rate rise belongs to Labor. It's a consequence of a government that has let inflation get out of control and has failed to take leadership on addressing the biggest economic challenge that Australia faces today. Labor's budget did nothing 
to convince the RBA that that rate rise wasn't needed? What did the Treasurer think was going to happen when he delivered a high spending budget at a time of high inflation? Either he doesn't understand basic economics and, or he's ignored the warnings and he doesn't, or he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's happy to have Australians pay the price. Jim Chalmers and Anthony Albanese are the ones that need to explain themselves to the Australian people, not the Senator RBA Durham, government. Senator your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I'm genuinely surprised that Senator Hume has uh, put her name to this motion uh, about our budget, uh, about how it fights inflation uh, and how it provides cost of living relief. Um, because it was her questions uh, just a couple of weeks ago to both Dr Lowe and Dr Kennedy um, about the budget and inflation uh, ec at economics estimates, which actually carefully drew out uh, the evidence of the budget's disinflationary impact through our energy plan, uh, a plan opposed by those opposite. Uh, so I'm surprised that the senators come back for more today. Uh, I'm surprised that she wants us to talk about the disinflationary impact of the budget. I'm surprised that she wants us to talk about the cost of living relief that the budget does provide and the restraint that the budget provides. But I am more than happy to talk about those topics today. Uh, we know that rising inflation um, means a cost of living crunch for Australians, especially those on lowest incomes who are doing it tough. Uh, and that's why our budget addressed inflation head on. Getting on top of inflation is the central focus of our government's economic plan. Uh, and as the Treasurer said on budget night, our task was to restrain spending to check inflation while doing our absolute best to help people who are struggling to make ends meet. Our cost of living package was targeted to do just that cheaper medicines and cheaper GP visits for those who need them most, investment to tackle high energy prices, boosts to job seeker, single parent payments and to rent assistance, and a historic pay rise for hundreds of thousands of predominantly women who were working in aged care. Not only will this cost of living relief package help Australians with their household budgets, but, as Dr Lowe confirmed just a couple of weeks ago, the budget is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. Uh, and of course, you don't need to take my word for it because you can listen uh, exactly to what the Reserve Bank Governor said um, at estimates just a couple of weeks ago. And I quote, I don't think that the budget is adding to inflation. It's actually reducing inflation in the next financial year. Uh, and he went on specifically to note the effect that the government's energy price relief plan will have on the economy. He stated, and I quote again, the fact that one specific government policy is able to take 0.75 per cent off an annual inflation rate, I think is really important. Not only does it help people with their finances, but it lowers the headline rate of inflation. It lowers the headline rate of inflation. That is from the governor himself, uh, and it's my recollection that it was from the governor himself in response to questions asked by Senator Hume. Apparently, the senator wasn't listening. The causes of inflation are well known. Um, it's driven in part by Russia's illegal war in Ukraine and also by broken supply chains, caused in no small part by a wasted decade from those opposite who decided to throw manufacturing off a cliff instead of back it and invest in it. And Australians are paying the price for that today. Australians understand that we didn't create the challenges that we're facing, but they did elect us to take responsibility for addressing them, and we are. This budget is about responsible spending while helping the most vulnerable in our communities. It was responsible to return 92 per cent of improved tax revenue to the budget over the forward estimates. It was responsible to keep real spending growth to an average of just 0.3 per cent a year over the forwards and to keep our own policy decisions to less than $10 billion over four years. And it was responsible to do the hard work of finding $22 billion in new savings, um, work that the previous government uh, failed to do. It was responsible to do all of that, and we did. 
uh, and our AAA credit rating has been affirmed, backing in Australia's budgetary approach, the approach of our government. Our budget and our economic plan, it delivers. It targets much needed relief to those who need it most. It brings down inflation by capping energy prices and by providing bill relief, measures opposed by those opposite. And it restrains spending and restores revenue to the bottom line. Ours is a budget for the times, relief for those who need it, responsible Senator for the challenges Walsh, we face. Senator McKim. All right, you're good. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Greens will be supporting this motion. Labor's budget does next to nothing to fight inflation, and it does next to nothing to deal with the cost of living crisis. And given the extremely contorted rationale of the Reserve Bank and Labor's decision to vacate the field, Labor's budget also does next to nothing to stop the likelihood that the RBA will keep smashing renters and mortgage holders with more interest rate rises. However, while the Greens agree with the opposition in their identification of the problem, we do not agree with the opposition's prescription for dealing with the problem. It is not workers who are driving inflation. Inflation in Australia is primarily being driven by supply-side shocks, shocks and corporate profiteering. And to the extent that demand is contributing to inflation, it is older and wealthier Australians whose spending is holding up just fine, while younger people, who of course are far more likely to be renters or mortgage holders, who are bearing the brunt of the RBA's interest rate increases, those people have already, to a large degree, closed their wallets. So there is massive intergenerational inequity going on in this country at the moment. So in the face of inflation that was sparked by supply shocks and is being exacerbated by corporate profiteering, we actually need the government to step into the breach. Now, I note the opposition's language in the motion regarding the freezing of interest rates. Well, that's exactly what the Greens have been calling on the government to do. Treasurer Jim Chalmers should step in, use the powers that he has and that have existed for many, many decades in Section 11 of the RBA Act and overrule the RBA. I now look forward to those in the opposition who understand the history of monetary policy opposing the government's proposal to repeal Section 11, which was a recommendation of the RBA review, because it was the Menzies government who established the RBA with those Section 11 powers, because in Menzies' view, the government should ultimately be responsible for monetary policy. The government should stop at freezing Interest, should not stop at freezing interest rates. We need a multifaceted approach to tackling inflation, including freezing rents, taxing corporate super profits, taxing the super risk, rich and bringing in monopoly busting divestiture powers. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I just want to make some, something crystal clear. This issue of inflation in this country is completely owned by the Labor Party. The budget that was handed down a month or so ago has done nothing to address the cost of living pressures and the inflationary impact in our economy one iota. There is nothing that's been done. And I listened carefully to the remarks of those opposite, including you, Madam President, when you were over in the other in your chair, uh, the Madam um, Deputy, Act, Deputy, Acting Deputy President, I should say, uh, there is there is nothing that is in this budget that is seeking to address this cost of living pressure, and in, in fact, inflation. We've seen 11 interest rate hikes under this government, and what we know is that everything is going up. Everything is going up. 
Australians are facing increased costs of living across almost every part of their own personal budgets. Costs of living is going up. Power prices are going up. Gas prices are going up. Taxes are going up. And mortgages are going up. People are paying more and they're feeling the pain. And as I've been engaging with people in my community back in Western Australia, it is the biggest issue that people are raising. And if you're not hearing that, then you've simply got your ears closed. Because this is the biggest issue that people are raising. Even people on quite significant salaries. I had someone that's on $115,000 a year. Now that's a decent salary. It's above the average. Someone spoke to me only two weeks ago. It's a single mother with two children. It's struggling to make ends meet, even on that sort of salary. It's impossible people are finding it. And this particular person, the only thing that she could figure that she could cut was a Netflix subscription. That was going to net her what? How much is a Netflix subscription? About 20 bucks a month? Mm. Right? It's, 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 it, this is impacting everyone. Everyone. And the Labor Party, the Labor government are to blame. The RBA's decision to lift the cash rate from 3.85 to 4.1 per cent last week can be put down to only one thing, and that is Labor's inability to manage money and refrain from spending. And with inflation at its highest point since the 1990s, Australians have struggled to make ends meet. Mortgage holders are facing the highest debt burden since the 1980s. $185 billion in new spending since the Labor Party came into office. That's having an inflationary impact. That's putting upward pressure on inflation. Labor's budget did nothing to put downward pressure on inflation. Australians with a mortgage of $750,000 are now paying $1,856 more per month. That's more than $22,000 extra dollars that these people must find. Cost of living, as I've said, is the number one issue that Australians are facing. And this government is distracted on other projects and is not doing what they need to do to help Australians address their cost of living. Labor has no plan to bring down the cost of living. And they try to blame many other things. They blame the Ukraine war. They blame Putin on this cost of living crisis that we're facing. Yet they're doing nothing to address it. Now, if you listen carefully to the words of the Reserve Bank governor last week, and those opposite and others, their champions within the media, are doing their best to make a boogeyman out of the Reserve Bank governor. But let me tell you, he said something that was really powerful. He said that people, very few, very few people understand what's actually going on here when he said that the unit cost of labour, the unit cost of labour is the measure of wages versus productivity is going up. And that means that without productivity improvement in this country, we're going to see further increase in inflation. And there is nothing in the budget, in fact, legislative agenda that's been proposed by increasing union control, by increasing putting upward pressure on wages but not doing anything to lift productivity, is just going to further exasperate the problem. And the unions are big about talking about wages and the Labor Party is big about talking about higher wages. But if you're not seeking to increase productivity, then all you're going to do is drive up the cost of living. All you're going to do is drive up inflation. And that's what Thank you, Senator is left by this. O'Sullivan. Senator Sheldon. Good, thanks very much. And look, I just, Senator um, Welsh was making some very fine points before, and I, I think I might just grasp a little bit of what you were saying before, because obviously those opposite aren't listening. This is the unbearable truth about the budget. The Reserve Bank Governor made it clear our budget is addressing inflation, not adding to it. And I quote, as Senate estimates on the 31st of May 2023, in an answer to those opposite, the Governor General, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Mr Lowe said, I don't think that the budget is adding to inflation. It's actually reducing inflation in the next financial year. And that's the point. They can't live with the unbearable truth that the budget that was put down by the Labor government, by the Albanese Labor government, was a budget which successfully is tackling the issue of inflation. Because 
as they know across the way, when we go to the issue of inflation that the, and the, some of the techniques to battle inflation, the budget is critical. It's got a big tick from the Reserve Bank. Now, what you have to also look at is the pressure around the world on the budget and inflation around the world. And of course, everyone around the kitchen table is worried about what is happening in the future and, whether we, and the economic plans to actually meet those challenges. So you have to have reasonable cost of living responses, which we've done. You've got to invest in skills and industries to lift the speed limit on our economy. We're investing after a 10-year drought from those opposite. We're addressing the skills issue within this country. And of course, you have to have sensible spending, restraint and budget management. And we're doing that. We've made those changes. But what you won't hear them say on, those, on the opposite side, they won't talk about the massive profits that have been taken through this period. They won't actually look at the sorts of questions that are raised and headlines like from the ABC from Michael uh, Janda, where profits dominating inflation according to OECD research. But it's really that simple, isn't it? Or the opinion piece from Ross Gittins, big business cries poor on wages even as profits mount. Or Shane Wright, corporate, corporate profits heat up inflation, OECD. I mean, the reality is that the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, you know, that, right, that progressive left wing organisation run by that very progressive left wing leader of the OECD, <laughs> says that the latest economic body to publish research showing an important role played by historical high corporate profits in explaining the surge in inflation after the COVID pandemic. It goes on, as Jim Stanford made this observation, director of Australian Institute of the Centre for Future of Work and policy director, this new OECD research is fully consistent with our earlier research on profit price inflation in terms of its methodology and its conclusion. I mean, clearly, if we want to deal with the cost of living issues, then one of those important aspects is something about the rights, labours and labour and conditions of working people and the middle class in this country, which shrunk under those opposite. It shrunk because they keep voting against every proposition that this parliament puts and every proposition this parliament passes to turn around and making sure that working people, middle class people, have an opportunity to turn around and lift themselves. Because multi-employer bargaining reform, they voted against it. Supported bargaining system for low-paid feminised industry. they industries, they voted against it. Removed limitations on single interest and multi-employer bargaining. They voted against it. Empowering the Fair Work Commission to arbitrate intractable bargaining disputes. Heaven forbid you would have thought that would be one they'd vote for. They voted against it. Because they are not about improving the opportunity for people to come into the middle class, to deal with the cost of living pressures. They are about the bland marketing of their position, which is contrary to what the Reserve Bank says and contrary to every piece of legislation that has been put forward and before this, uh, this parliament when it comes to labour rights and many other areas of dealing with cost of living pressures. You know, clearly, when it comes to the future of cost of living pressures, I'll see how they vote in the future IR legislation coming before them, and whether they'll take the side of the middle class of Australia or vote against them again. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Australians laughed 12 months ago when they were told that life wouldn't be easy under Albanese. That laughter has been replaced by fear and tears. We've heard from Labor senators talking about inflation and quoting from the Senate estimates effort of Senator Hume and others over the last few weeks. Let me leave you with these key dates. The budget came out on the 9th of May. The Senate estimates process began on the 22nd, the week beginning the 22nd of May and the 29th of May. The RBA lifted interest rates on the 7th of June to 4.1 per cent. That is a sign 
It is the lifting of interest rates on the 7th of June to 4.1 per cent by the governor of the RBA that is the, that is the judgment the judgment about whether Labor's second budget has been doing enough or will do enough to tackle inflation in this country. Let me remind you that inflation has peaked to 6.8 per cent in April, up from 6.3 per cent in March. Inflation is the greatest curse on the Australian economy, and on this side we contend that Anthony Albanese as Prime Minister and Jim Chalmers as Treasurer are not doing enough. And indeed, indeed, one Labor senator told us that it's the war in Ukraine, it's supply chain issues that are causing the inflationary problem. Well, I say that is just not true. And it's not true, not because Senator Smith says it, it's not true because the statement of monetary policy released by the RBA in May says it's no longer true, and indeed the government's own budget papers say that the inflationary pressures in our country are being caused by other matters. Inflation is a great curse. It is getting deep into our communities. First home buyers, low income earners, retirees on fixed income. These are the people that over coming months will feel the real pain of the inflationary pressures in our economy because the government is not doing enough to address them and all of that work is being done by one institution alone, and that is the RBA and the governor. The inflationary pressures in our, con in our country leave no one behind. They will be felt in school communities when parents can't pay school fees. They will be felt in sporting clubs when families can't pay for equipment or annual fees or match fees. They will soon be felt in our businesses as businesses start to pass on those inflationary pressures. And indeed, the RBA says in its statement of monetary policy it is the inflationary expectation that is now in the country. Thank you, Senator McKim, for nodding in agreement. It is the inflationary expectation that is now cementing itself in the psyche of Australians and Australian businesses that will become very, very, very difficult to move in the future. Anthony Albanese, as opposition leader, trying to get into the lodge, said that things would be better under Labor. He said mortgages would be cheaper, and we know that is just not true. And so why are Australians feeling the cost of living pressure more acutely? Because when I go around Western Australia, people are saying to me, Senator Smith, life is getting harder, but I feel like I'm working more. What a remarkable revelation. Because that anecdotal ex experience that is shared with me is also shared in the statistics. Australians are now working the most hours ever since 1978, but feeling poorer for it. Over the last three quarters, the GDP per capita growth has been zero. Hours worked have hit their highest level since 1978. Productivity has collapsed, with GDP per hour work decreasing for three of the last four quarters, and net negative GDP per hour worked in the four quarters since Labor come to government. Life is getting very difficult for Australians. In the final few moments, it is first home buyers in this country that are living in the outer suburban areas of our cities that will feel the pain. 1.9 million fixed rate loans turning to variables Thank you. over the calendar Senator years. Smith, your time has expired and the question is that the motion moved by Senator Hume be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on pages five to nine of today's order of business. I'll start with uh, page five on the order of business, documents on page five, and see if anybody is wishing to address any of those documents on page five of the order of business. Page six of the order of business, and I call Senator Orman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
I move that the Senate take note of document number 21 as listed on the notice paper. It is distressing to see another report detailing the continuing failure of governments to do one simple thing – fully fund public schools. If you stick a microphone in front of the Education Minister, he's bound to tell you that he doesn't want to live in a country where kids' chances in life depend on how rich their parents are or the colour of their skin. But to be clear, the government has no plan. In their recently released policy platform, the ALP have dumped any commitment to fully funding public schools. The minister is intent to keep spinning our public schools and the concept of public education as a pillar of social equity into wonkish oblivion. The system is being crushed under the weight of fragmented piecemeal policy that capitulates only to the interests of private schools. There are simple maths here. The only state or territory in this country with fully funded public schools is the ACT. That means that a majority of kids enrolled in public schools in this country will not attend a school funded to its minimum standard of resourcing. Many of these kids will spend their entire schooling career hearing about this mythical pathway to full funding. Tomorrow, thousands of kids will wake up and go to thousands of public schools around Australia that will have to keep stretching paper and string to hold together kids' education. They will be taught by a workforce that is underpaid, overworked and burnt out. Peering into the future, the future is bleak. We're at a crisis point. We have continued to throw dragon hordes of public money into the private school system while we have driven the public system off a cliff. Another pillar of Australia's social democracy kicked in the teeth. Negotiations on the next national school reform agreement are already underway. This is the last chance we have to bring the public school system back from the brink. Labor has the chance to come riding over the hill to save the day, but at the moment it looks like they're vacating the field of battle. Uh, thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Did you wish to seek leave to continue your remarks? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I do. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, I rise only to correct an error of my own making, which was that I failed to lend my voice to our opposition to the urgency motion because I was too busy thinking ahead about committee reports, etc. Um, we would have sought to oppose and divide on the question of the urgency motion okay. uh, put by the coalition. Thanks, Senator Pratt. I'll just um, seek advice from the clerk. Okay. Um, I seek uh, leave to put the question about the urgency motion um, again. Is leave granted? Thank you. Uh, the question uh, now is that the urgency motion um, moved by Senator Hume be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Um, division required? Is a division required? Yes. Yes. Um, Ring the, a division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the urgency motion as moved by Senator Hume be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order. There being 38 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative.